Hi, today I'm going to talk about Lacan's misunderstanding of Freud. This is not an attack on Lacan, but I want to clarify some of the differences that I see between these two important psychoanalysts. Much of uh, this discussion comes from my recent book, Misunderstanding Freud with Lacan, Zizek, and Neuroscience. I have a particular chapter on Lacan and Freud. Um, so I want to warn people that um, we should understand before we critique um, in the sense that um, some people are like totally invested in Lacan and so they'll be you know immediately offended and not um, try to think about what I'm saying. Um, other people just completely dismiss Lacan. And so I'm trying to offer more of an ambivalent interpretation. I, I have been profoundly influenced by Lacan, but I also think it's possible to criticize someone that has influenced you. So one of the key concepts that Lacan introduces where I see the first big distinction between Lacan and Freud is Lacan's notion that the unconscious is structured like a language. This is one of his earliest theories and it exists throughout most of his work. Um, and if you really read Freud, um, it's not the question of the unconscious being structured like a language, but it's more so a question of what he calls the primary processes, which are symbolic. So for instance, when you have a dream, um, automatically the images in the dream represent other things. So they all represent symbols and that they're related to each other through association, but also there is a form of substitution and displacement. So all the things that structure language occur automatically in our minds when we're dreaming or when we're thinking um, without control. And so when we get to the question of what is the unconscious itself, I think this is one of the biggest issues in psychoanalysis and outside of psychoanalysis, for Freud, there is a very definite definition. The unconscious is defined by repression. And repression means lying to yourself. And in order to lie, yourself, lie to yourself, you have to divide yourself between the part of yourself that knows the truth and the part of yourself that no longer recognizes the truth. And so all these things are related to each other, the unconscious, repression, self-division, self-deception. They're all part of the same thing. And mainly for Freud, we lie to ourselves in order to protect our ego, or in especially the idolized version of our ego. So we want to avoid anything that makes us look bad, anything that questions us. Um, and we often are influenced by how society determines what is good and bad behavior or what is a good and bad person. And so we internalize what Freud and Lacan called the ego ideal, or the ideals of the ego. And those cultural ideals help to shape how we see ourselves. So Lacan says, um, also says the unconscious is the discourse of the other. And I think it's better to say that the unconscious is distorted by symbolic representation. So when you repress something, when you deny something or you don't want to think about something, Freud's idea is that material that you've repressed gets restructured, gets connected up to the primary mind or the primitive mind and the primary processes. And so it does go through a process of substitution and displacement, but we have to distinguish between the primary processes and the unconscious. The next big difference is Lacan is really talks a lot about this concept of jouissance, which in French, the first kind of uh, definition of jouissance is orgasm. And the question is, is jouissance different from pleasure? And how does jouissance relate to the pleasure principle? So it's infor important to realize that for Freud, the pleasure principle Pleasure is really about escaping unpleasure and unpleasure defined, he says, by tension. And that we can also relate it to anxiety. And so this is a very kind of different idea compared to a lot of philosophers and psychologists. The idea that fundamentally pleasure is kind of a form of escape and also a form of death because we're trying to get rid of any type of extra stimulation, any extra um, 
simulate um, stimulation. So Freud also argues throughout his work that there's a fundamental conflict between society um, against sex, violence, and nature itself. And so societies are structured and organized around the control of sex and violence. Now, as I said, the term jouissance is very hard to translate. Often it's translated in English as enjoyment, but I think that really loses this meaning of orgasm and also release because orgasms represent the stimulation and then release. So ultimately the pleasure we get from orgasm, according to this theory, is that first there is a stimulation, but then that stimulation is removed and it's the release that gives us the pleasure. Now, Freud also very clearly focuses on the difference between the reality principle and the pleasure principle. And ultimately, the idea is that we seek to avoid reality if reality causes tension or conflict or anxiety, and that pleasure is a fundamental form of escaping from the real world and from acknowledging things in ourselves that we don't want to think about. Now, Lacan, in his later work, will say there's no sexual relation. And I think one way of thinking about that is this idea that fundamentally our sex drives are really autoerotic in the sense that we're focused on self-stimulation and then the release of that stimulation. And so it really, even if we're in a relationship or we're involved in a sexual act with someone else, the, the emphasis is really on the individual being stimulated and then releasing that stimulation. At the same time, Freud says that all social relationships, all relationships we have with other people have kind of a libidinal aspect. They're all a substitution for some type of primal form of sexuality. And one of the keys that Freud develops is this distinction between love and drives. So for instance, drives are often autoerotic, there's self-stimulation. Um, one of the easiest ways to think about drives is to think about addiction. In addiction, you don't have to have a relationship with other people. It's compulsive. It can lead to self-destruction and therefore a form of the death drive. Um, on the other hand, love is about submitting to the other. Freud connects love to hypnosis to the group formations of churches and armies and says that basically love is really about the sacrifice of the self to the other and the suspension of reality testing and blind faith and a leap of faith and blind love. Um, and so some people see this distinction between Freud and Lacan as represented by the distinction between the early and late Lacan. So the idea is in his earlier work, say up to 1964 or 60s, um, he focuses on interpreting Freud and stays pretty faithful to Freud's ideas. But his later Lacan, um, after 1960s, um, is more focused on these issues of like jouissance, uh, there's no sexual relation, and kind of a critique of Freud. Now, one of the defining differences is that Freud put a lot of emphasis on the reality principle, and Lacan virtually never talks about the reality principle. And instead, he talks about the real. And he represents the real often as something that's enigmatic. So his two early ways of defining the real is the real is what is impossible to symbolize, making it in that enigmatic and ineffable. But also, the real always returns to the same place. Um, and so one reason why he kind of rejects Freud's notion of the reality principle and of reality testing is that he wants to argue that the analyst should not be the tester of reality for the patient. So what he sees as one of the problems with a lot of other forms of analysis and therapy is that the analyst is supposed to play the role of judging reality for the patient. And so then the patient identifies with the analyst as the one who knows and the one who can properly judge reality. Now, for Freud, a key concept that relates to the reality principle and his notion of the real is this idea that memories can never be completely effaced. So anything that we've thought or felt or experienced on some level is retained on the level of our memories. And once it becomes a memory, then even if we can't retrieve it, and even if we've, we've repressed it, denied it, 
or rejected it, it still exists somewhere in our mind. And so this means that it's ultimately impossible to completely repress something, that everything that repress ultimately returns. And here we have this idea of the return of the repressed, which is related to Lacan's idea that the real is defined by it always returns to the same place. But if you look at Lacan's famous four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis from 1964, instead of using the reality principle as a key concept, he uses the term repetition. But in his discussion of repetition, he also focuses on this idea of the return, that the idea that once something becomes a representation that's internalized, becomes a memory, then it's impossible to completely efface. And so one of the things that Freud bases his theory of science on and his theory of the reality principle is this idea that we really can't escape the reality, that reality always returns, not just external reality, but also the internal reality of our own memories and our own experiences. And then Freud adds that in order to have science, you have to be humble about what you know, and you have to be open to criticism and to critical introspection. And following Descartes, he defines reason as the ability to distinguish fact from fiction. And the way that this is developed in psychoanalysis is the analyst has to remain a neutral, impartial um, um, witness to what the um, patient is saying. And likewise, the patient has to learn to be neutral about their own ideas and feelings and memories. And so the idea is that just like modern science is based on the neutral observer of empirical evidence, in the case of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic treatment, the patient has to learn how to be a neutral unbiased observer of their own reality. Um, so Lacan tends to focus on the unknowability of the real um, and that it returns, but it cannot be symbolized. And I think that often this is interpreted by some of his followers and sometimes it's in his own discourse is almost like a mystical experience, the ineffable real. But in reality, we can think about any experience we've had, any memory we've had belongs to the real. And even if we try to not think about it, even if we try to deny it, it always has the possibility of returning. Another big issue and a conflict between Freud and Lacan is the notion of the other. Now, Lacan takes this idea, I believe, from Hegel's philosophy. Um, but the other can represent very different things in Lacan. It can represent a deity or a god. It can represent the other sex. It can represent another person. It can represent language, society, the realm of truth, or the storehouse of words and signifiers. Um, for Freud, the key question of our relationship to others and to the other, we might say, is the question is why do we submit blindly to social authority? And so he has several different explanations for this. One is the way that we resolve the Oedipus complex, the way that we overcome, say, for instance, our desire for the mother and our um, rejection of the father as interfering in our desire is that we identify with the father. But often this requires some type of threat. So within social situations, we can think of this more broadly, the idea that social organizations often create conformity and order through some type of threat of violence, some type of threat that if you don't um, listen to what the authority says, the leader says, then something bad will happen to you. Um, and then Freud argues like the superego, so our internalized conscience, he says, judges our egos by the standards of the cultural ideals. And so this is about the way that we internalize the ideals of others, of society and of culture. So we internalize the other as the superego. And part of it is through the resolution of the Oedipus complex. Um, another aspect of this theory is Freud says that if we wanna understand the fundamental social bonds, we have to look at um, love, hypnosis, army and the church. And what he arguing is that just like in love, the lover 
is often blind. The often the lover will often suspend um, disbelief and the reality testing. The lover will also do whatever the beloved says to do, and that it represents a cultural ideal that we love um, people or ideas that fit into um, cultural standards. And he compares love to hypnosis and the idea that in hypnosis, you also blindly submit to the suggestions of the hypnotist. And so he wants to argue that in both love and hypnosis, we have this regression between a helpless child and an all powerful parent. And that we see the same structure in social groups like armies and churches. And so at the foundation for Freud of all social relationships is this fundamental giving up of the self, um, escaping from the self in order to submit to the law of the other. And then as Lacan points out, the social world that we submit to, the social system, is often structured by a set of ideals and debasements that form a structural hierarchy and he calls this the discourse of the master. So I think the theory of narcissism, I think is one of Lacan's greatest contributions. And it really um, clarifies things that are quickly said in Freud, but never fully articulated. So basically if we wanna understand narcissism and the narcissistic personality disorder, which Lacan never speaks about, um, it really was developed after his work to a great extent. Um, but the idea is the fundamental relationship for the narcissist is that their idolized ego, their idolized self, um, has to be verified by an other who's placed in an ideal position. And this idea is derived in part from Freud's notion that behind each demand that, say, a child makes to a parent, there is a fundamental desire for total recognition, knowledge, and love. And this creates the foundations of the transference in psychoanalysis, where the analyst is placed in the idolized position of the one who is supposed to know. And so that basically when we go into analysis, we're looking for someone who we believe has all the answers. But we also want someone who's going to recognize us and see us in a positive light and see us in an ideal way. So it's often very hard to do analysis and therapy with someone with narcissistic personality disorder because they only want to be idolized and they um, have a horror of any type of criticism and rejection because their goal is this fundamental desire for recognition, knowledge, and love from the other. Now, another key difference, and I think in some ways where Lacan goes beyond Freud, is Lacan brought up this fundamental issue of how do you remain neutral in analysis, but you also don't feed this narcissistic structure of being just the other who verifies the uh, patient's representations. So um, looking at the case of the rat man, Freud's case, he gives a scene of the dead, he, the rat man leaves the door open and stands in front of the mirror and exposes himself. And he says that the rat man is trying to catch the look of his already dead father. And the idea here is that in analysis, especially with narcissistic patients of obsessive compulsive patients, um, what they really want the analyst to do is just to verify them, just to recognize them. They don't want the analyst to judge them, question them or criticize them. And so the problem is if, if you maintain a totally neutral position as the analyst, this will often only serve to support what the patient actually wants and which undermines the patient from learning anything new and dealing with their unconscious. So the question is, how do you remain impartial, but also not play the role of like the dead father who can only verify and recognize the patient? So one of the things that Lacan developed, which is very controversial, is what's often called the short sessions or variable sessions. So instead of seeing patients in a ritualistic 50 minutes uh, time frame, he would change how off, how long the, each setting was, each meeting was. And when I was in analysis, um, I found that one of the effects of not knowing when the session would end 
was that um, I would quickly speak without censoring myself. And I think that's one of the main goals is to try to get people to speak without um, questioning themselves, without censoring themselves. That is like the foundation of free association. And many people, especially obsessionals, have a very hard time doing that. And so you have to create certain structures, certain technique that enables free association. Um, and then another very radical idea that Lacan said was that the analyst should authorize him herself or herself to be an analyst, meaning that there shouldn't be an official training program because that creates conformity. It creates a ritualistic behavior. It creates a whole kind of control system. And so he had this very kind of radical idea that the analyst, you're an analyst when you declare yourself to be an analyst. And once again, this works not only to undermine or upset the um, obsessional patient, but also the obsessional analyst. And it also breaks with this idea that the training analyst is the subject supposed to know. And one of the things that Lacan did in his teaching, he noticed his teaching and his writing have a transferential effect, was that through his style, through his discussions of knots, of of topology and complicated math, he showed that he was trying to delay the quick understanding of his students and to break up this idea of him being the subject supposed to know. Now, whether that worked or not always is unclear, but generally we can think of Lacan as in some ways articulating a lot of Freud's theories, creating some technological or technique innovations, and then also in some ways confusing some of Freud's fundamental issues.